Hi. This is Keystep Pro from Arturia. It's a MIDI keyboard controller with four built-in sequencing tracks, each capable of acting as a polyphonic sequencer, or alternatively, a drum sequencer in the case of track one, and three arpeggiators in the case of tracks two through four. It can control MIDI instruments, software or hardware, or modular synths with control voltage. I got literally hundreds of questions about it on my Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube accounts. In this video, I'll go over what it can and can't do, compare it to a few competing products, and try to answer every single one of those questions. I'll also break down everything going on in this jam during this video, as well as play it for you without me talking at the end of it. Let's get started. Let's start with an overview. The overall build seems very solid and sturdy. It weighs close to six pounds or 2.7 kilos. Keystep Pro has a three octave mini key keyboard. If you're familiar with the Keystep, the keys feel exactly the same. They're velocity sensitive with channel aftertouch. Each track is color coded and there are LEDs above the keys and in the step keys to help you figure out which track is the active track for sequencer tracks optionally a drum track on track one and arpeggiators on tracks two through four, as well as a control track where these knobs can send out MIDI CCs. For these tracks, the drum or sequencer or the arpeggiator or sequencers is an either or proposition. So track one can be either a polyphonic sequencer track or a drum track and tracks two through four can be either in sequencer mode or in arpeggiator mode, but you can move between them pretty freely. You have pitch and modulation touch strips and a third touch controller under them, which is used for creating short loops in patterns, octave control buttons, and hold and transpose buttons. We'll dive into the details in a bit, but generally speaking, the sequencer on each track can be any step length from one to up to 64 steps, which you control in four pages of 16 steps each. In the four sequencing tracks, these knobs control pitch, gate, velocity, time shift, and randomness or probability. And in the control track, they send out MIDI CCs. Each pattern is up to 64 steps. You can chain up to 16 patterns. And there's also a scenes function, kind of like an Ableton Live grid. We'll get to that obviously later on. The shift function operates all the blue secondary functions on these buttons and above the keys as well as over here. Keystep Pro is very much knob per function, but there is a utility mode with a few menus that let you control several settings and configure Keystep Pro. Everything I mentioned, the four tracks, the control track, the sequences, patterns, chains, scenes, all of that can be stored in a single project and Keystep Pro supports storing up to 16 projects. You can back those projects up onto your computer using Arturia's MIDI control center software. From a connectivity perspective, Keystep Pro has two MIDI outputs and a single MIDI input. It can also send MIDI over USB to a computer or other instruments with a USB host port. It has quite a few control voltage outputs if you're controlling modular or semi-modular gear, eight gate outputs for modular drum machines or to trigger anything else you want, clock in, out, and reset, and four sets of CV, gate, and velocity or mod controls to control up to four modular voices. Keystep Pro also has a sustain pedal input and metronome output along with a level control in this little knob here, as well as a tiny metronome speaker on board, which actually works quite nicely. Keystep Pro can be powered either via USB as it is here or through independent power, and it also comes with a power adapter. It's USB MIDI class compliant. However, it cannot be powered by an iPhone or a lightning based iPad on their own. So you'll need one of those camera connection kits with power to use this with an iPhone or iPad. I've not tried it with the new USB-C iPads. Finally, for the overview, Arturia's MIDI control center software lets you reconfigure Keystep Pro quickly and easily if you have a computer nearby. Before I dive into the details a bit about this setup, track one is Squid Salampole from ALM playing drums triggered by the gates out here. You could of course trigger drums in a groove box or on your computer. Track two is a bass software synth running on my computer nearby. Track three is both a software pad as well as 
SWN or SWAN over here, which is a wavetable synth. I control the mix between the two using this mixer, and then track four is Ocoast going through some reverb. Let's dive into the details and start with the arpeggiators. Keystep Pro has three tracks which can be arpeggiator tracks, tracks two through four. The sequencer needs to be running for the arpeggiator to work, and then you just play an arpeggiated pattern as you'd expect. You can use the hold button, obviously, to hold the arpeggiator. There are a few arpeggiator modes over here. So up will always go up. Start out by the order things were being played. Down is down. Up and down that doesn't repeat the notes at the edges. And one that does. Random. And Polly will play a chord, which Ocoast can't, unfortunately. So if I lower Ocoast and change to a piano sound, then I get a chord. So pretty straightforward. Additional options, if I go back to up mode, are octaves, up to three, and down one. Time divisions can be applied to all tracks, arpeggiators and sequencers. This is relative to both main tempo and other tracks, and you've got triplet time divisions as well. Then you can apply scales to anything going in through Keystep Pro. including changing the root and uh, user scales. More on that later on. These four knobs work when you're playing an arpeggiated pattern. So let's do this maybe and go back to one octave. Okay, so gate will change the gate of the pattern. Velocity will change the relative velocity of the keys because the arpeggiator is velocity sensitive. Time shift will shift it forwards and backwards in time. It's relevant mainly if you're playing arpeggiators on multiple tracks. And randomness will play a different octave every now and then. Last but not least, you can run more than one arpeggiator simultaneously. So if I get, say, this going, I can go into track three and run a completely different pattern. Let's say. At a different rate, of course. So let's say go into a slower time division or triplet time division. Time divisions also work with sequencers, of course. So a very neat jamming and performance feature multiple arpeggiators running simultaneously. So that's pretty much it for the arpeggiators. Let's talk about melodic sequencing as opposed to drum sequencing. You've got four tracks, each of which can run its own independent sequence. Let's take this piano sound, for example. There are three ways to enter notes into a sequence. Quick record, step record, and by playing in real time. Quick record just means holding a step and playing the notes you want to appear in that step. And the sequencer is polyphonic. I hit play. I've got that in here. Let's enter this chord here. You can change these parameters on a per step basis. So if I wanted gate to be longer here, let's say eight beats over here. And then again, eight beats here. If I wanted to increase the number of pages, I would just add it another page with last step, then go into the second page and then add another chord here. Let's say go with this one and I want its gate to be 16 beats or this is good. So now this is my pattern. Another way to record is called step record where Key Step Pro automatically advances a step for every note I play. So that's pretty simple. And this works polyphonically as well. So 
let's say go here. And this is a good opportunity to show you how a pattern can be any length. You just hold last step and press the last step. Each of the four tracks can have a different length as well. And finally, let's go into another pattern. The last way to record is just to record live into a pattern. For that, you can either have a beat going or use the internal metronome. You activate the metronome by holding shift and tap tempo. And this is what it sounds like. You can control its level with this knob and it can get pretty loud. Now the metronome is going pretty fast. It also has subdivisions, which you can change in the metronome menu. So let's maybe have it chill a little bit. Then you can record, you can record either quantized or non-quantized. So quantized will not record any of the nuances. But if you hit shift record, you can record unquantized. Let's clear out this pattern, maybe make it two bars long. So let's see how this goes. Unquantized recording. It missed the first part. Let's record that again. As you can see, a really nice way to record very natural sounding phrases. As before, once you have the notes in, you can edit them. Now editing chords can be a problem, especially when the timing is separate on a per note basis, and that's where step edit mode comes in. So this will show you the notes that I played on each step, and when I play more than one note, you'll see a few notes, and you can see the timing, velocity, and gait for each and every one of those notes by hitting the notes and you could edit them that way as well. Very nice way to step edit not only chords, but also patterns that you play unquantized. One last thing, when you edit a step, if you're in overdub mode, you can add notes to that step, up to 16 note polyphony, and if you remove overdub, you can immediately replace the notes in that step. All right, let's talk about sequence modifiers. For that, I'll start a new pattern and just step record so it's easy to understand what's going on. There are a few shift patterns. You can invert the order of a pattern. Nudge it left to right. And then of course, clear the pattern or clear the steps, transpose it, semitones up or down or whole octaves. There's quantization for patterns that are recorded unquantized. There's random order, which will randomize the order of the notes. And you can just add random notes. And then randomize the octaves of the notes. So that's pretty much what you need to know about sequencing. Let's talk about drum sequencing. So like I mentioned earlier, track one can be either a regular polyphonic sequencing track or a drum sequencing track. When you sequence drums, things change out a little bit. The first 24 semitones on the keyboard represent different drum sounds. I've got five cables going out the five gates. So we're only getting five sounds out of squid sample out of eight possible sounds. I could turn down squid sample and open up a software kit as well. Let me just do that here. So this is a 707 kit. And then you get whatever is in your software drum kit. Again, this works either with hardware or with software. The neat thing about drum sequencing, let me just open up a new pattern here on this drum track, is that it works like you'd expect from a drum sequencer. So I've got nothing going on here. If I say hold the kick, I can program kicks wherever I want them. Let's maybe go for a higher tempo and continue to, you know, sequence just as you would any other drum, just as you'd expect. And you can, of course, record live as well. So to the best of your finger drumming abilities or not. And this can also be, of course, quantized or unquantized. Let's stick with these toms. And 
Now, I've sort of done this in passing. You can mute or unmute any of the tracks with its mute button. In drum sequencing mode, you can also mute individual drums, and there's two ways to do that. You can either hold the mute button and say, mute the kick if I wanted, or these. Or just get into mute mode by holding drum and mute, drum mute, and just easily mute and unmute sounds like this. Where was I? Here we go. Now remember before I mentioned that each track can have its own length using last step and that can serve for very interesting polymetric patterns. Well, it turns out that in drum mode, you can have each drum track or each drum sequence have its own length. You enter that mode by holding shift and drum mode poly for polymetric. So this is my pattern, but I could say choose the kick and make it only two steps long for a nice fill um, or Maybe go for this, um, this, let's say, make it completely irregular, maybe five steps. Okay, again, for very nice polymetric experimentation. This is as good a time as any to mention the swing function, which works both globally, and you can also create an offset on a per track basis with shift. Finally, for drum tracks, each of the notes is mapped sequentially, typically for how drums are mapped out on software and hardware instruments, but you can change that in the utility menu. You just head out to the drum map, then move it from chromatic mode to custom mode. And once you do that, head into config and can literally on a note by note basis for every one of the 24 semitones or 24 notes, change the target destination note. You can't currently change the target destination channel like you can in the B-Step Pro. It would be a nice addition. So that's pretty much it for the four sequencing tracks. Remember, all four can be polyphonic sequences. This can be also a drum track and these three can be arpeggiators. Let's talk about the last track and track type, which is the control track. It sends MIDI CC messages out these five knobs. You can also sequence or automate all five knobs or control parameters to keep things interesting. I've changed the setup a bit. As I mentioned earlier, you can connect Keystep Pro to an iPad or iPhone as long as you have it powered with a dongle or camera connection kit that accepts external power. So here I'm controlling Moog's great mini Moog app and I've got knobs mapped to the filter cutoff, resonance, as well as filter decay time and just overall loudness or VCA envelope decay. Yeah, and recording this motion is just as easy as recording a sequence. Make sure you're in control mode, set the pattern length, hit record and play, and you can record automation live. Okay, notice the motion here and here. It's maybe change resonance. That got automated as well. Yeah, and keep going. Now you can edit these parameters step by step as well if you like. You can either long press a step to see its status. When you do that, there's a chance of turning off a step so you can enter step edit mode and just jump step by step and change any parameter you want for that step. All right, back to the old setup. Let's talk about scales. Scales are basically a filter for anything you play. So I can play chromatically, but if I move, say, into a major scale, then regardless of which note I play, I'll only get major notes. Same goes for minor. I can change the root of the scale by holding root and then pressing, say, over here. So now I still get a minor scale, but an E minor scale. So next time you're in a band situation and they ask you to play in, say, B flat mixolydian, tell them no problem. Finally, you've got two user scales. If you wanna play in scales that aren't written here, you can customize user one and user two. And this is really useful, not just for getting into custom scales, I think, but also for sort of like applying generative techniques to any sequence you play. So let's, for example, say, play this pattern, which of course should be played in up-down exclusive mode. 
Okay, so that's what it sounds like in a major scale. This is what it sounds like in a minor scale. But if we go into user scale, which by default is chromatic, but you can customize it by holding user and picking any notes you want. And yeah, we can go for, you know, major, minor, and so on. But if you narrow down notes even more, really nice things can happen. And this is a lot of fun to play with. You know, there are two of these. So from a performance perspective, I think user scales are a very interesting generative option here, way beyond just adding scales that aren't included by default. All right, so up until now, we've been talking about single patterns. Let's see how we put these together into chains and into performances. I'll go with, say, pattern number one here, which is this basic pattern. You can copy patterns very easily. Just hold copy and pattern, then choose the pattern you want to copy, and then paste and pattern and choose the slot you want to paste it into. Let's say paste it into slot five. So now if I go to slot five, I'll have this pattern. And let's copy it again, All right? Paste it into six. Now I've got it into five and six. But if I go into slot six, I want to mess it up a bit, say with random octaves. So that's how you go ahead and fill out the patterns and create new patterns in your track. Then if you want to chain patterns, you simply hold chain and then press the pattern number you want to chain. Check out the screen here. I've got zero patterns in the chain now. I can maybe put one copy of this, then move into six, then move back into five and move back into maybe two and one. So that's my pattern chain. You can also put patterns multiple times in a chain. And then when I hit play, it will go through the patterns. If I didn't mention it up until now, this number represents the pattern you're on. So this is pattern six. And we're supposed to move on to pattern five again. Then pattern two. You know what's coming now. Before we move on to scenes, you saw me copy and paste patterns before. There's an undo function here, which will undo erasing a pattern or pasting a pattern. It's fairly limited now. It would certainly be nice if this was expanded to more functions. Anyway, moving on, scenes in Keystep Pro are one of my favorite features. They let you change multiple patterns and other parameters at once. Each scene in Keystep Pro contains a snapshot of the mode for each track, which patterns and chains are running in each of the four tracks and their mute status as well as hold status. And you can save up to 16 scenes within a project. So if I go back to my project and there's a handy reload function, which will reload it. So let's take a look at how scenes work in the jam that I played in the beginning of this video. I've got seven scenes. Let's move into scene number one. This is just the note coast playing. Three other tracks are muted. If I move on to scene two, Notice the drum track gets unmuted. Let's move on to scene three. Notice that pattern changes are quantized. Changes happen at the end of the bar if weight load is active. In this scene, I automatically moved to control mode so I can control the level of my pad. Let's move to scene four. Notice patterns change tracks get unmuted. Go ahead and mess with anything else that I want. Let's move on to scene five. Okay, mutes, pattern changes. I can do whatever I want, play with a filter if I want. Move on to scene six. Change the arpeggiator pattern, which is a sequence, by the way, here, programmed in arpeggiator. Now for scene seven, I wanted things to quiet down and I wanted to play the bass line myself. So I needed focus to change to track two, which is what happens when I move to that scene. Okay, I can now play whatever I want. And close out the song. So that's how you play scenes. Saving them is super easy. If I wanted to create a scene where, you know, track four is in focus and is in arpeggiator mode and is, you know, these are the mutes, for example, I would just go ahead and hit save scene. 
choose a slot, slot eight, and that's pretty much it. You notice how I change scenes, everything else changes according to what was saved, all the settings, knob positions, active tracks, you name it. All right, so zooming out from scenes are projects. Like I mentioned before, a project contains all the information, pattern scenes, controlled mode settings, tempo, and so on. Keystep Pro can store 16 projects on board and you can back them up onto your computer using Arturia's MIDI Control Center software. You can save projects if you like. You can copy projects to new slots if you like. And of course you can erase projects too. Let's move on and talk about a few performance controls. Once you've got your sequencers or arpeggiators going, you have a few performance options. We already discussed randomness in the context of an arpeggiated pattern, right? That shifts octaves up and down. When you record sequences, then randomness controls the probability that a step will happen. So let's say for example, step number one here, and choose to have it happen only, let's say, around, you know, 30% of the time. So, yeah, it didn't happen there, it didn't happen there, and it did happen there. So that's randomness in the context of sequences, which is probability. We already mentioned mutes. Okay. There's also solo, a solo option. So you hold shift and you can, uh, let's say, Solo the bass line if I wanted here, then unmute that. We talked about drum mutes for drum tracks. Then there's the looper function, which will loop different length segments in your song. So let's say... And they'll always pick up from where they were supposed to be at before you press the button. And there are different length loops. 1 16th loops loop a single step, and there's even a faster 1 32nd loop. You can also choose which loop you loop when you press this. So let's say if I press a fourth of a bar, I can move to this part, or even a part in the middle, or let's say 30 seconds. If there's a particular part I want to loop. sound good or bad depending on your tastes and may work or not work with different patterns. Now currently the looper doesn't have a note repeat or roller mode like the Beats Tip Pro. That would certainly be nice. Hopefully they'll add it in a future firmware update. Let's take a look at a few other performance functions. Let's hit play here. Transpose will let you transpose a pattern. and it'll stay transposed as long as transpose is lit. So I could say transpose it up, keep that going until I clear the transposition. While we're on the topic of clear, clear lets you clear holds and transpositions across multiple tracks. Let's take a look at a few more performance functions. I mentioned the arpeggiator patterns for when you're in arpeggiator mode. There are also a few playback options for sequences. When you're in sequencer mode, there's forward, and then random, which will just play random notes. And then walk, which will sort of walk forward, but every now and then jump back through the pattern. So it's a nice way to get variety from a performance perspective when you have a programmed pattern. And I think I already mentioned this before, wait load will wait to load a pattern. So as long as this is on, when I change a pattern, it will only change at the end of a bar. If I turn it off, the change will be immediate. And you can configure the weight load quantization in the utility menu. Another nice performance feature, if you mess a pattern up beyond recognition, so let's say random order, random notes. Yeah, why not? You can simply reload a project with shift and save. Let's take a look at a few other performance functions. You can create splits by holding a track and then pressing another track. So now I've created a split where no coast plays on top. 
this is my baseline. And you can choose the split point by holding both together. Hope you can see the color change on top here. So you can always see what the split point is. Chord mode is also a nifty performance function. You program the chord by holding shift and chord and then choose any chord you want. Then you can play that chord. You can also choose more conservative options, even just a simple fifth apart, which plays very nicely. This also works with the arpeggiator, by the way. With randomness too. So this is without randomness. And with randomness, the entire chord gets transposed. Really sweet feature. Let's take a brief look at the MIDI Control Center software. There's not much going on here right now, let's say compared to the BeatStep Pro, which lets you transfer patterns and edit them using the software itself. Potentially, hopefully, this will be added in a future firmware update. This is only the beta version, but you've got quite a few controls over device settings already. The MIDI channels, both input and output for each of the tracks. I obviously won't go through all of these, the metronome settings, launch quantization options, MIDI settings, and this is a nice segue into modular control. Now I already showed you how I control drums on squid sample here using the gate triggers in the back. By default, each of the tracks is allocated one voice, one set of pitch, mod or velocity and gate outputs. You allocate voices to tracks using shift and CV routing. So you can see here in track one, everything is dimly lit. It's not getting any outputs. Same goes for track two, but track three gets all four. I've got four pitch gate pairs hooked up to SWN here. So when I play a single note, one output is used and then obviously two, three for a triad and up to playing four polyphonically. I'm not exactly clear how the round robin happens. Sometimes it does cycle through the voices, which is cool for when you have an arpeggiator running. Sometimes it doesn't. It would be nice to have a configurable round robin option here. So that's how polyphonic modular gear can be controlled. There's no velocity input here, so I didn't use the velocity outputs. You could also configure the velocity outputs to be controlled by the mod strip. If we go back to the MIDI control center software, you can see that pitch has all the typical modular suspects, as does gate, by the way, V-triggs, S-triggs, different voltage triggers. Now, a lot of these things can also be controlled in the utility menu. So if we hit shift utility, let's go through this very briefly. MIDI channels, both input and output, just like you saw in the MIDI control software before. Sync options, both on the input and on the output. Metronome we talked about earlier. Launch quantize. Okay, that's the weight load function. MIDI settings, won't go over all of these. Typical suspects, CV settings. That's what I mentioned before on a per voice basis. Pitch format, just like in Control Center. Gate format, again, like in Control Center. And let's see what else is hidden here. Controller, so these are the MIDI CCs for controller mode. You can change the CC, the port, and the channel, as well as minimum and maximum values. It's great that there's a port option here so that information doesn't get sent out all the channels. I couldn't find that on the, um, on the MIDI sequencing tracks, but maybe I missed it or maybe it's coming in a firmware upgrade. It would be nice, by the way, if you could rename the knob name so that the name of the parameter you're changing would appear here as well. Touch strip control. And we talked about custom drum maps earlier. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the utility menu. All right, so let's wrap up and talk about alternatives and pros and cons. Before I made this video, I asked what people would like me to compare this to. Let's start with Novation's SL Mark III. I made a video about the SL Mark III. I'll link to that below. You should really check that out for the full details. But generally speaking, the SL Mark III is bigger, more expensive, but does more. More tracks, extensive Ableton Live control, more controls, splits, and automation. That said, Keystep Pro has some advantages too. Beyond being smaller and cheaper, it also lets you run more than one simultaneous arpeggiator and has more CV outputs. Next up, the comparison I was most asked to make was to the BeatStep Pro. Now, relatively speaking, the BeatStep Pro is actually quite small compared to this. 
aside from the obvious difference of having pads, so if you're into finger drumming, this would be more appropriate as opposed to keys. Pros for Keystep Pro are four tracks instead of three, and that these tracks are all polyphonic, as opposed to the two melodic tracks on Beatstep Pro, which are monophonic. Both have drum tracks, which are polyphonic. Pros for Beatstep Pro are that it's smaller and cheaper, and it also has a Mackie UI mode for controlling the basic functions of your DAW, like track levels, panning, mutes, and solos. And Beatstep Pro also has 16 assignable CC knobs in controller mode, as opposed to only five in Keystep Pro. Hopefully in the future, at least they'll add bank functionality here. So maybe with a shift function or something else, you could control different sets of parameters with these knobs in control mode. Beatstep Pro also supports a workflow where you have immediate access to pitch, velocity, and gate on a per-step basis. Now, it's not that you don't have access to those in Keystep Pro, it's just that you need to select the note first and then change the parameter as opposed to selecting the parameter and then having immediate access to all 16 steps. A big advantage for Keystep Pro, in my opinion, is the fact that you can record unquantized melodies and chords, obviously all polyphonic, with micro timing. Keystep Pro also has a true arpeggiator, while Beatstep Pro has a less powerful arpeggiator. However, Beatstep Pro does have roller functionality for these pads, which currently at least Keystep Pro does not. So obviously there are a few more smaller differences, but I think those are the main ones. Overall, my recommendation is that unless you need the pads for finger drumming, if you have the budget, the Keystep Pro is the better option. Aside from those specific examples, let's take a look at pros and cons overall. I'll start with who I think this is for. If you just want to play MIDI notes into a single synth or into your DAW, the Keystep Pro is overkill. You don't need four tracks, you probably don't need all these CV outputs or a sequencer or arpeggiator. But if you want to perform or jam or play live with multiple instruments, whether software or hardware ones, Keystep Pro is one of the best contenders out there. These are early days and notable missing features are ratchet support, as well as compared to Beatstep Pro, more expensive MIDI control center software configuration options. Hopefully our trio will add these over time. It would also be nice to have CV slides as a sequencing option, which you currently don't have. And of course, if you need to sequence more than four instruments at once, you'll find Keystep Pro limiting. Also, I'm testing the beta here. There are some bugs here and there. Hopefully these will be squashed before this is released. So having said all that, if the limitations I just mentioned don't bother you, Keystep Pro is feature rich, allows for adequate simultaneous tracks and features and is relatively compact. It's fully unquantized polyphonic recording option lets you program in very natural sounding sequences. It's drum sequencer means you don't need to get a separate one and it's multiple arpeggiators are a blast to create with. Most important of all, and I'll stop this Vegas mode, even though it has a lot of features, I felt that everything was in its right place and easy to learn, making it very easy to recommend Keystep Pro as the brain of a small to medium sized setup. One little request, Arturia, can we get it in black, please? So that's it for Keystep Pro. If you want plenty of ideas on what to do with a sequencer like this, check out my ever-expanding book, available to people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful, and ring the bell after subscribing if you want more content like this. Feel free to ask me anything in the comments section below. Thanks for watching.